This is a story that involves various mafia. John was working in Soho, London for the Maltese Mafia. He had run-ins with the Jamaican Yardies. He had run-ins with the Albanian Mafia. But perhaps one of the most gripping stories is the work he put in as an enforcer for the German. So, thanks for coming on, John, before you head off to South Africa. You're welcome. How on earth did you fall in with the Maltese Mafia? Um, well, through my uncles, really, uh, Sean. I had um, two of my uncles, George and Dave, were pretty notorious in Glasgow at the time. In fact, my uncle George was told by um, Arthur Thompson, who was one of the most well-known um, gangsters, that he's a liability and he should get himself into London out the way. Was that, um, is he known so, as the Godfather, Arthur Thompson? Yeah, 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 he was. I think but, um, Johnny Boy Steele, I don't know, he spoke about him. Um, my uncle was just a bit crazy, really, and he was he would definitely have been a liability. Um, my other uncle, Dave, had escaped from prison and had um, legged it down to London. So he started a new life down in London. How did he escape from prison? Uh, in a really simple way. Um, uh, when you go into prison, you know, you've got the main gates kind of like open and the van goes in and then there's another gate and then that gate closes and only when that gate's closed, that one opens. But way back then, so you're looking um, late 60s, early 70s, they drove the prison van in with my Uncle Dave in it into the interior bit and um, they opened the van door before the gate had closed. And so he, he jumped out with the handcuffs on and he legged it out and squeezed through the gate as it shut. <laughs> Stole a car and <laughs> I was gone, you know. Was that Bellini? So, it was Bellini, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it was Bellini. Jo that's what Johnny Boy Steele escaped from there a few times. Oh, did he really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, he, he managed to get his brother out of there and he managed to put him back in. Wow, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. crazy. That's mad. <laughs> but he escaped to London um, and then the police caught up with him. I'm a bit unsure of the circumstances, but eventually the police caught up with him. Um, and he got put back into prison for escaping in in London. While he was in prison, uh, he shared a cell with um, a Maltese guy who was um, the nephew of a very well-known um, Maltese mafia guy. I can't even remember his name, but he was the one that started like the sex industry in Soho. Perhaps just as um, well we don't remember the name. <laughs> yeah, I also don't like to give too many names away anyway, but... Yeah. Uh, you, your watchers can Google if they Google Maltese Mafia, Soho. They're going to see he was he's he was called Big something Big George or I, know, I can't remember his name, but this nephew was the guy that then took over, um, and he was raised with money. Uh, this guy, uh, he was a bit soft, really, like you wouldn't have thought he was a mafia guy when you met him. Um, he was. He went to private school and all that kind of stuff. So he had loads of money, a bit, bit of a tough, but also ruthless as well because he had the power to click his fingers and, and have something done. Um, but he wasn't capable himself of a lot of violence. He just had the heavies at hand. Anyway, this guy ended up, uh, it, we all called him Uncle Tony. So Uncle Tony was then put into prison. I think it was Wandsworth Prison. And uh, he was put into a cell with my Uncle Dave. Uh, who'd escaped from Barlini. Um, Uncle Tony, because he had a lot of money, was a bit of a target for other prisoners then, in them days that wanted to take advantage. So a couple of guys came in to, to bully him, and my Uncle Dave stood up, slashed one of the guys, and protected Uncle Tony. So Uncle Tony said to him, when he gets out of jail, he'll give him a job, you know, he'll find a job for him. Um, and so Dave spent the rest of his time looking after Tony in prison. When he got out... Uh, he went to see Uncle Tony in Soho and he said, I don't want to work for you. I want to be your partner. And a partnership was formed. And uh, so my Uncle Dave got into the sex industry, running all the peep shows and um, hostess bars, which were just nothing but clip joints in those days. What does the clip joint, what does that mean? So when you see those old images of Soho, it's, very, it's changed today. But um, the, you used to see a lot of these signs that said live show, live show. And way back in the 60s, pretty much punters could go in there and they could see either a full-on live sex show or, you know, very strongly simulated one. Um, the council then were trying to close all of these things down, calling them immoral or illegal. Um, and so 
the only way that the clubs could stay open was to remove the word sex from the live sex show part and call it a live show. So with a live show, you're not promising a customer anything, are you? Apart right. from a live show. Yeah. But of course, it's Soho. You're up there with all your mates, you know, you're on a bit of a stag do. You see live show in neon, girls, girls, girls. And generally, a customer would pay um, two quid on the door, so a cheap price to entice them in. Um, on the ticket, it would say you, you have to buy a drink when you're in the club. Uh, you would then go down into a basement, which was very uh, darkly, you know, there wasn't a lot of lights in there, a lot of tables. You'd have girls in um, suspenders and stockings, scantily clad, and a bar. Um, and the, the guys would be a bit disorientated. They're coming into this dark environment, it's Soho. It's a bit dodgy. They're expecting to see a live show. So a lot of these guys are pervs or married men that don't want to get caught. Um, it's a license to print money, really, because they must now buy a drink. They often don't look at the ticket that says you must buy a drink. Um, and then there'd be a table in front of them, like a little coffee table with a menu on it. And you charge very extortionate prices for drinks. Um, but of course they wouldn't look at the menu because they're too busy looking at the girls. Um, the girl would come over with a with a tray, a waitress, and she would say, um, would you like to buy a drink? And he would usually say, no, no I just want to see the show. There'd be a double bed in the middle of the floor, um, again, giving the illusion that there's going to be some kind of uh, sex show. Um, the guy wouldn't want to buy a drink, but he'd be told, you have to buy a drink. Please check the back of your ticket. So he'd check it and of course, you'd be like, okay, uh, I'll have half a lager. Um, they only sold non-alcoholic drinks because we didn't have an alcohol license. Um, and there was something on the menu that said, once you've paid for one drink, all further drinks are free. So that was used as, an, and again, an incentive if guys objected. So, well, look, look here, you know, it says there, if you buy a drink, uh, you can stay as long as you want and all your drinks are free after that. That would put them at ease, Okay. So they'd order a uh, half a pint of lager, which um, cost 12 quid. Um, bear in mind, you're looking in the early 80s, uh, where a pint of lager in a pub might be about 80 pence. Oh, yeah. All right, uh, Maybe a pound, pound 20. It's now it's 12 quid. Um, and then she would bring you your drink. And then, of course, the girl would say, would you like to get me a drink? You know, would you like a bit of company? And most of the guys would say, yeah, sure. So she'd order the most expensive cocktail on there, which was just apple and orange juice with an umbrella in it, but that was 50 quid. Um, and of course, he wouldn't know that. She's just saying, will you get me a drink? And he says, yeah. And then she'd sit with him. And after five minutes, um, I would send one of the guys, or I would go over to collect the bill. And the bill might be around four or 500 quid. And all he's ordered is half a Coke because there's the hostess fee Jeez. for her company. Uh, there's her drink. And so there's all sorts of charges. So all of a sudden, the guy's confronted with... Uh, you know a lot of things and then he's still waiting to see the show so one of the girls at that point would get onto the bed and act a little bit provocative and uh, we had another guy who was part of the Maltese Mafia he was called Martin he was what we called the showman so he'd come out and jump around and say uh, guys I'm gonna I'm gonna perform with the girl now so we, we want tips the bigger the tips the more I'm gonna perform you know and he'd come around with a jar and after these guys have spent all their money now you know they're just in this position where they put more money in, um, and then they would just simulate um, some sort of sex act. It was it was the weirdest thing. She would be on the bed, um, kneeling towards the end. The showman would stand in front of her with his back to the audience, so the guys couldn't see, and they would simulate oral sex, although there was nothing happening. He'd just get his belly button out, um, and the guys would be trying to see what's going on, and um, then it'd be, that's it, show's over. And now you've got to kick them all out. And um, that's the point where the fear factor comes in because predominantly um, you don't need to be the hardest man in the world. Even when the place is full of 20 guys, you might often think, surely I'd kick off. You're from Witness, you know. Lads are hard up in Witness, you know. <laughs> you had a group of lads down there from Witness, they might want to kick off. Yeah. But it's amazing how, how people's bottle goes when they're out of their small pond and they're in a much bigger pond, and they're in Soho. There's that whole illusion of um, mafia, gangsters. Am I going to get shot or killed? They're in a dark, dungeony type place. They've got a guy that's really confronting them in a very aggressive way, which is 
is what you used aggression to get them to pay the bill and then chase them out. And you had no end of customers because it's in the middle of the West End. The next lot had come in and this would happen all day. So, so it's like there's a sucker born every minute. Yeah, so it, so it moved from something um, that um, guys were seeing, they were seeing something, to the council trying to shut it down, forcing the clubs to then become clip joints. So it became a clip joint. The hostess bars were nothing but clip joints, promising an illusion of a live sex show. Um, but again, there was nothing in the advertising that mentioned the word sex. It was just a live show. And so you begin to see these live shows springing up everywhere. In response to government bureaucracy, how sad is that? Yeah, I know. Uh, and then they, they, they were making a lot more money really from peep shows. So peep shows were where guys would go into a booth. There would be um, uh, a mirror, two-way mirror, a one-way mirror on, on the wall with a light behind it. And they would put a, a pound coin into the into the mechanism that would switch the light off for 30 seconds. they get to see the girl on the other side of that mirror and she would be stripping off or slowly stripping. But of course you get 30 seconds and so you've got to put another pound back in. So they had maybe about 14 or 15 booths uh, there and it was like non-stop from the moment you opened in the morning till the time you closed at one o'clock in the morning. It was a constant flow of guys putting pound coins in and making a mess in the booth. So somebody else had the uh, unenviable job of mopping out the booths after every customer. Um, and it's Like a, a shower in a man's prison. Yeah, a little bit like that, yeah. I guess. Um, but, just, uh, but constant. Mm. Um, it didn't smell very nice. Oh. Um, I'm, I'm, I have to admit, I had to do that job at one point oh. as well. Um, and the other job I had to do was um, on the other side of the booths, um, they had buckets, uh, like a window washing bucket, where all the pound coins fell in. So my job would be to crawl under there um, because there was a platform above you where the girl, the girls were on the bed. So you crawl under there, change the buckets over, and those buckets would be, be poured into the coin machines. And the two peep shows were, were bringing in about £40,000 a week. Jesus. Um, that was a lot more back then. It was a lot of money. Um, so my uncles were, were doing really well. They were millionaires. So if in the clip it. joint, if someone didn't have enough money, suddenly they've got like a two or three hundred pound bill and they've only gone in with like 50 quid. Yeah. What would you, how would you handle that? Well, they just pay what they have at that point once you've worked out whether they have money or not. They could pay by check. They could pay by, there was a lot of uh, tourists. So often, not so much these days, but they, they carried, um, uh, cashier's checks or I don't know it was like a, a like a checkbook but it wasn't a check I forget what they call them a, a money thing anyway they could they could pull it out and give it to you and it was like money orders cashier's yeah, checks yeah, things yeah, like that yeah like a money order type thing what so, about if someone just said this is a rip off I'm absolutely not paying uh, well then uh, intimidation would 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 come into play at that point and uh, sometimes people just didn't have have the money you know and so you had to be able to work that out or not how far you could push somebody. What you didn't want is people walking out of place with with a busted nose. You didn't want to have to use violence unnecessarily. I've used violence a lot in my life, I'm ashamed to say, and I always justified it by saying it was very controlled. I was a very controlled person, so I would never exert more violence than was necessary. That's how I justified using it, whereas some of the guys I worked with were, were uncontrollable in their violence. Um, but you you don't want to use violence in that environment. You don't want to bring police attention if you if you can help it. How do you know um, where to draw the line? Because I've seen these videos of guards murdering inmates in the jail I was housed at, and it's like the, the violence starts and they get on someone like a pack of wolves, and then even when the person is unconscious, they're still on one of them. This woman guard is saying, "Stop beating him." His face has turned blue, and they don't listen, and the prisoners are yelling stop beating him, he's already dead, and they, they, they can't stop themselves. How do, you, how do you have that ability to stop at a certain point? I don't think it's an ability. I think you, it's just something that's in you. Mm. Um, some guys, the red mist comes down and you can't stop them. I've worked with loads of guys on the doors, and we'll talk about that later, um, who are just dangerous because, yeah, they'll, they'll stamp on people's heads or they'll choke somebody when they're down. They want to ki kill them and you have to then physically pull them off. Um, and other guys, 
I think probably the more dangerous ones were 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 guys who were more inclined to be like me, who were more controlled, because there's you you detach the emotion from it, and when you detract emotion from something, I think it can make you dangerous because you don't really care, mm. you don't you don't care, and you're willing to to push it to whatever level it takes to get done and not think about it. Whereas maybe guys where the red mist comes down can be can be more dangerous in, in the respect of if they lose it, um, they're going to get themselves into trouble or they're going to kill somebody. But I think, yeah, I think you're probably more dangerous when, when you think you've got control. So it's more strategic yeah. than animalistic. You know, the guys I worked with on the door used to think that I was a bit of a, a nutcase because they never saw me really get get very angry. I didn't get angry. Um I was very controlled. I was measured, so I would I would measure my blows. I didn't profess to be the hardest man on the block or, or whatever, but I would be very calculated. So if I'm gonna if I'm gonna punch you, if you're a threat to me, I'm thinking I'm just gonna punch you in the throat and not and take you out or or I'm gonna stick poke you in the eyes. So I want to inflict maximum damage in the shortest time instead of fighting you for ages and risk killing you. So my mentality, I guess I was quite cold in that way. Maybe it's because of my upbringing or whatever. But I was very measured. So I was able to to ascertain quite quickly whether somebody had the means to pay or they didn't or if they were holding out. Uh, And also, you know, I've got to tell you a a funny aspect of that story is uh, the beer was all alcoholic. Right, non-alcoholic, sorry, non-alcoholic, uh, literally zero alcohol, not not even low alcohol. We we couldn't serve low alcohol, um, and I've seen guys get totally blind drunk because they think they're drinking alcohol. <laughs> uh, some kind of psychological effect. Placebo. Effect. I've had them pay like you know two three hundred quid for a bill, and now they think right, stuff it now. I'm going to stay here, and I'm going to drink. I had one guy who had about fourteen pints of non-alcoholic beer. And we had to help carry him out of the place and put him into a taxi. <laughs> the, the guy was totally inebriated. I mean, gone yeah. completely. <laughs> and, and he'd had no alcohol whatsoever, you know. <laughs> it's a funny thing, psychology, you know. And I guess it was a bit, a lot of psychology in those clubs in Soho. Um, and like I say, that you're not in your hometown anymore and you don't have backup. And you don't know what's going to happen to you. Most people paid. <laughs> 